everyone on Casey's mom. Oh, <laughs> so you're what spawned that. Excuse me. <laughs> this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Now, you know, I have been following the career of tonight's guest since he was doing drag at La Mama as a mere child. And now he's the biggest star on Broadway, as well as a celebrated playwright, librettist, and film actor. So here to introduce him, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'd never even heard of our guest until he made a big splash <laughs> at Hairspray, but he is an absolutely <laughs> terrific actor. He's Ooh, giving one of those Riedel. iconic Broadway performances <laughs> not to be missed, the wonderful Harvey Firestein, welcome to Theater Talk. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll be the judge of welcome or not. <laughs> 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 we'll see who's still standing at the end of this session. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, I'm in trouble, I can tell. Um, all right, Harvey. I'm curious to know, uh, this terrific uh, creation of yours, Edna Turnblatt in, um, in, in Harrison. Blad. Blad, sorry. Blad. Edna Turnblatt. Yeah, you get John Waters down on us. <laughs> Created by John Waters, but when does sort of the writing of the character give off to the performance. I mean, you're a writer too. Did you write some of the lines? Did you rethink this character? When does it become your creation? Well, theater is communal. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, it, and it's the one thing where egos do have to sort of fade away for the communal ego. When does the character become yours? When a character needs as much as Edna does for the, for the actor to become it, I mm -hmm. think, um, I think my ego may allow me to think that she's much more mine than she is um, <laughs> because I'm the one who suffered the slings and arrows of shaving my arms, my legs, <laughs> my eyebrows, my chest um, because I'm the one who has to strap in certain parts of me and blossom out other parts. I wear 25 pounds of, of liquid fat um, in, my, in my fat suit. I, I, I dance in high heels. I wear wigs that weigh two and three pounds each. Um, I'm at the theater two hours before anybody else to, to get into all this mm -hmm. and I do all that darn work and so she's <laughs> mine. <laughs> now, and she's messed up my social life so that's even better. That's right. Because <laughs> it's very hard to date when you're shaved, not shaved only from here to here. <laughs> and the term black. It's, it's not pretty in a speedo. <laughs> Oh. I don't remember when I was pretty in a speedo. <laughs> why does Edna Turnblatt have to be played by a man? It's you're playing a woman, I know, but why? Why don't they get you know Lainey Kazan for the touring company? That's my why suggestion. My suggestion was that Lainey Kazan would be brilliant <laughs> in the role. But really? they, but yet they went. And they're going to have uh, uh, our friend Bruce the Land. Yeah, Bruce is. Probably why is it always? Do they always go to a man um, to play Edna? I think it's more subversive that way. Mm. Um, I mean, you know. You, John Waters always felt, and this has more to do with the film than the show, mm -hmm. John Waters felt, you know, how, how incredibly subversive it was to make a G-rated film, to be John Waters, the right. man famous for feeding uh, poodle poop to a, a drag queen. Um, well, not only that, but giving the, the, the poodle an enema first. <laughs> but um, that this man would make a G-rated movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and then, then when you come see our show, that the wonderful emotional moment, the 11 o'clock emotional moment of the show is this beautiful number between two middle-aged people enjoying each other. And the two middle-aged people are actually two men. Though I'm playing a woman, it's, it's really two men. There's something wonderfully yeah. subversive about that. Would it be wonderful with, with, with Lainey? I think it would. Would it be different? Yes. Yeah. And so that's a choice that, that the creative team and the producers made, that they want to try and keep it a man. So it's merely a choice, not a necessity. Yeah, and yeah. I, uh, I would think. Yes, but, but what, uh, what I think is so re remarkable about your performance and about that wonderful moment, which is really one of the great moments of any, any Broadway show, when you and Dick Latessa <laughs> dance, two people who've been in love all their lives. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's a wonderful moment to play. Um, I, I don't really see you as a man in drag. I mean, I see Edna Turnblad as a 100% a woman. And that's, that's how the audience the sees her too. Theater, that's the magic of theater that, 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 that is done there. And so it's wonderful that we can do that magic trick right there. And it's not a, a magic trick that sounds cheap. Not at all. But we've worked really hard for two hours to get to that point where you will love that moment of those two dancing. And I mean, 
I can't tell you what it's like to perform that. Middle-aged heterosexual couples but, love but, that moment in the theater. Oh, absolutely. And they adore it. Oh, but, absolutely. But, and, and, and to play yeah. it, to know that you have that audience in your hearts, you know, that, that they're all watching this couple who we don't, you know, Dick and I are, are two all vaudevillian types yeah. to start with. We don't play that scene for the audience. We play that for each other. Mm. You know, we're trying to make each other laugh, to hold each other, to dance with each other. These aren't, you know, it's not like Fred and Ethel Mertz showing you an old routine they used to do. Right. These are two people in an apartment cheering each other up. And it's wonderful to play, and it's wonderful magic. Now, would it not be the same magic if it was a man and a woman? I think it would be different. I don't think it would be as effective. Yes. I it, don't think it would be as effective. No, and, and, and I have to say, as a female, I, the, I perceive that the gender bending it, it, as, a, as a commentary on, on, on stereotypical femininity, that's very interesting. But I'll go back to say, you've done drag for years, as I, I said in the intro. Absolutely. I, you know, since, since Andy Warhol's Pork, right? right. So the, yeah. our, you know, since and on the, tor kid. the Torch Song trilogy you wrote for yourself. But nothing like this. But, <laughs> but still, there's something about that that, that that resonates within you that you. That you yeah. That, well, that I you think blossom it, play I think it roles. allowed me to, to enter it with a little less trepidation. I knew how to walk in heels right. already. Um, I've <laughs> worn wigs, I've worn makeup and all that. Though I didn't do drag for so many years, you know, since the movie of yeah. Torch Songs the yeah, last time, yeah. right. I was 86. And I said to my makeup artist, I was, I was sitting there trying to put on my eyeliner, you know, very early on. I said, you know, this was so much easier when I was young and could see, first of all, but <laughs> when the skin was sort of straight, you know, now it's like painting over crumpled brown paper bags. It's very <laughs> difficult to well, do. Well, well, why'd you do drag in the first place? What? What about doing drag called to you that when you were, what, what just Whoa. a teenager, you well, said, let's go oh, and do it? Oh, it's really a very strange, complicated story of, I think, being an effeminate kid, you know, and, and, and I have a lovely children's book about that called Sissy yes. Duckling about being yes, an effeminate yes. kid. But um, when I was with this community theater, I was an art student, and, and um, a friend of mine, her mother was starting a community theater in Brooklyn, which still exists now, the Gallery Players, and mm -hmm. I was one of the founding members as this kid who went to make posters. Then they said, do you want to pull a curtain? Do you want to do, you know, and I, and I got folded into theater, I don't know how, and there all of a sudden there I was. And when I started working with this teacher from the Moscow Art Theater, Barbara Bulgarkova. <laughs> you um, thought I wanted to dress like her. <laughs> and she was this old Russian woman who would test your concentration by unwrapping candies while you were doing a monologue, and if you, she caught you looking over, she'd get up and hit you with her handbag. She had me do Juliet when I was like 13 years old. She said, the men's roles don't really fit you. You're not old enough to do the kinds of character roles. You will not work until you're 40 years old. She said this to a 13-year-old kid. Mm. She said, you won't work until you're 40, you're a character actor. So, but because you have all this emotional availability, let me give you young women's roles because at least they write young women's roles with some emotional vulnerability mm. that you can use. So it was, funnily enough, she who put me in drag, though I never was in drag, but I played Frankie in Member of the Wedding. Mm -hmm. I played Juliet. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek. I still remember. I'd like to see you do uh, that now. Ah, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet at the public I theater I, with I Harvey think I, I think I'm more the maid these days. <laughs> 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 Hamlet, your mother would like to see you in the closet. Um, but <laughs> but uh, that's sort of how it started. Then, then, uh, then I'm in art school and all that, and then there was this advertisement in the paper for Andy Warhol doing a play called Pork. I went to the audition. I'd never heard of La Mamba before. I'm 16 years old. I go down there, and what do I do? I, I think I did Juliet's monologue, which was the only thing I, so the monologue I had prepared. Mm. They were on the floor laughing. I couldn't understand why. I was the only person hired that wasn't a friend, you know, in the, in yeah, the circle. Yeah, in that gang, right. right. And they said, Sh you know, come, you know, first rehearsals on Tuesday at 2 o'clock at Great Jones Street and, um, you know, come and drag. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you're going to play this maid. And I said, what kind of maid? They said, an asthmatic lesbian maid. That's the role you're playing, by the way. Okay. <laughs> and the rest, as they say. Well, but interesting, though, and I, I just, it's a remarkable performance on Hairspray because I don't think of it as, 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 as a drag performance. But that's just it. it, it I mean, people I, think Harvey Firestein is a famous drag queen, but you're not playing no. a drag queen in this show. Absolutely not. And that's, and, and, and that's how I started all that talk, but that's how, that's what made it easier for me to start it. But once I got into it, no. 
I could use some of my skills from drag, but I had to approach it the way you'd approach any other role from the inside out. But I did follow people in the street. Really? Um, I did mother the cast, and the cast now treats me as the mother of the cast. I mean, um, it, it is my role socially. Um, did you follow uh, uh, heavy set women on the street to see how mm -hmm. they walked, to see how they mm -hmm. carried themselves in and out to of a taxi? See how people, and people, how and people how reacted they, to them? How people reacted to them and how they would hide themselves if they felt threatened, how they walked differently indoors than outdoors. That was important to me. I have, uh, I counted once, I have 16 walks I use in the show. Mm. There's 16 distinct walks depending on, on whether she's on carpet or ground or outdoors or people are looking at her or, mm. or anything else. Is this how you attack every role, sort of breaking it down to the point where you have 16 different walks and all you say, your little eggs no. for things? Or was this particular one that you... This is, this is unique for me because, well, I've been doing a lot of television and movies and, and it, that's totally different. Mm. Um, this was the first theater role that I didn't write um, in a really long time and, um, and so it allows you to do a lot of work that you don't do if you're the writer because right. if you're the writer, you already know everything and you yeah. don't have to break anything down. So I did have to break everything down and I wanted, I never, I wanted with this voice, a six foot tall, 250 pound man to be looked at as a woman. Yeah. Um, and that was my challenge, and that has worked. Yeah. Um, and that, and that is, uh, to me, you know, that is like the great reward for me in doing all the work I did. But I mean, I had funny stories. Like, you know, I would come out of rehearsal, and I'm thinking of myself as a woman. So I walk up to the bank, you know, and another woman has come to the to the door just before me, and she sort of looks out of the corner and sees a man coming. So she waits for me to open the door. Well, I'm waiting for her to open the door. <laughs> woman. And I finally say, "Honey, you know, there ain't no white knight coming. You better open the door. We'll both be out here forever." <laughs> but you know, my head was that into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's been an exciting thing. I mean, um, acting should uh, uh, necessarily allow you to play things you could never be. Mm -hmm. But this role, I mean, I will never be a mother for real. Um, but I certainly have motherly feelings that I've gotten to use. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never be a woman. I, I don't want to be a woman. I enjoy being a man. But um, oh, it's been a lot of fun yeah. um, to, to explore that side and 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 to to have this wonderful. And I and I couldn't do it without like Dick Latessa from day one. Never treated me as a drag queen. He never. always treated me as as um, as his leading lady. Hmm. And and has always taken pride when old friends come up to him, you know, Dick's been in the business yeah. for three, four yeah. centuries. Yeah. Um, and old friends come up to him and say, you know, you are my favorite couple on Broadway. You're my favorite couple I've ever seen. Oh, there's great Europe. chemistry. Yeah. Great chemistry. From and the beginning, the two of you just, I read so in an article in New York Magazine that, you, that, you know, the, the laughter you guys had, the jokes back and forth. The old always. Sort of, and, yeah. and, and Marissa too. Marissa and I, she was always my daughter. She was, you know, from good and bad, <laughs> good and bad. You know. Do you have to discipline her when she gets out of hand? And 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 she gave me lots of sass. You know, <laughs> so it was for the good and the bad of it. I, always, is that a mirror or a fly swatter? It's a it's a mirror. Oh. <laughs> now, one never knows on PBS. Before before. <laughs> I'm being much too nice no, to well, you. I know, you haven't checked me yet. I'm sitting quietly well, in the not, Well, now we'll set you up. The, uh, <laughs> be, be, long before Hairspray, you had a huge hit on Broadway with Torch Song Trilogy, which you wrote for yourself, you starred in. And then you wrote the uh, book for the big hit musical, La Cage La Fall. Cage and then you left Broadway for a long time. You stopped writing. And, and we were talking before. No, there we was had a bunch more. More. <laughs> there was a, a bunch, bunch more. You had Safe Sex. Safe Sex. Very safe sex. Safe Spook we, House. Forget Him, Spook House, Legs Diamond. But Legs there was a long period away. where you, were, you were really a dominant character in the Broadway world yeah. after Torch Song Trilogy, which made you a star. And every play you wrote was going to be done on Broadway. There was that great expectation for it. And then you were away for a long time. Hairspray's kind of brought you back to the fore. So yeah. why did Where'd you, you go, go away? And why did you go away? Um, a part of it was a great depression I went into, which had to do with AIDS and losing mm. absolutely everyone yeah. I knew. Um, part of it was, I, um, and part of that was I went into uh, a, a lovely, as, as all artists seem to, a lovely alcoholic bout, mm. um, which uh, happily Not I lived better. through and came, and came out the other end of. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough, because most people aren't lucky enough to, to live through that. Um, so I did, I went away, I did um, television and movies. <sighs> Theater really takes every bit of heart and soul you have. When, you know, when I read a bad review of anyone, I cry. I don't read, that's why I don't read, I don't read my own reviews and I try not to even read other people. Because I've never met anybody who 
could put on a show to fool somebody or to rip an audience off or take their money or do something to, to be mean. But you read critics and they tear things apart as if somebody was trying to pull something off on them. You know, oh, look at that, you know. I've never met a theater director anything like an Enron executive. You know, that's, <laughs> there's a huge difference between being an artist. Now, you may not like everybody's art, but it is their expression of who they are. They may have a lesser mind. They may have less talent. They may not know how to express themselves. You know, there is all that negativity you could say. Mm -hmm. But I've never met an artist who spent the hours and agony of putting on a show which pays nothing. I mean, even on Broadway, it pays nothing what? compared to what you can make in movies and TV and, and other things. Yeah. And you put your heart out there on the stage and have a bunch of people come along and call you a liar, uh, a thief, a, a, fraud. a cheat, yeah. a fraud. It's horrible. So after... Were there a couple of reviews, specific reviews to some of your work well, me, that well, drove you say, away? Let me just say that that Torch song only existed we only got away with Torch Song because we started at a walk-up theater. Well, each we play started was done, at La Mama, right? Well, each play was done separately yes. at La Mama. Yes. When each one was moved off Broadway on their own, they yes. all bombed. Yes. Mm. It took me three years to find a theater willing to put them on the way I had always wanted the three of them together. Mm -hmm. When I finally did, it was in a six-floor walk-up. We were about to close. We were playing to empty houses. We were about to close when Mel Gussow mm. and, and, um, and Rex Reed came. Mm. And um, John Simon came. And the three of them gave us these unbelievable raves. You know, they sat and watched the show with six or seven other people. <laughs> you know, a five-hour show at that point. Four and a half hours it was. And they raved about it, and then it moved off Broadway. I only allowed Torch Song to move to Broadway, figuring nobody, I, we'd been playing it for two years already, figuring let it close already. <laughs> you know, it'll never make it on Broadway. I need to get on with my life. I need to get on with my life, right? <laughs> I'd already written Spook House. I was mm -hmm. writing La Cage. I wanted to get on with my life, so I let it move to Broadway. But um, I don't think that had it moved to Broadway, um, had we opened it on Broadway, that, that critics would have understood it. I think it needed to grow the way that it grew. I think it would have gotten slapped around on Broadway. Uh, an example of it that we were talking about before was my play Safe Sex. Very now, good play, yeah. Without mentioning anybody's names because it, it, it's not fair out of context. Uh, there was a critic who saw it at La Mama and raved about it. Said, you know, the audience breathed at once. Every word out of Firestein's mouth was exactly what I was thinking. Mm. Three weeks later, literally three weeks later on Broadway, <laughs> tore it apart. Same critic saw it again and said, ah, person said, I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and you, and you know, and, and you, you know, and what that makes you feel like. But, but not only that, almost called me a liar. You know, there were critics who did uh, on my play Safe Sex say, what the hell is he writing about? AIDS is a disease. It will be cured in a year or two. It only affects gay people. Mm. Um, it'll be cured in a year or two. Mm -hmm. It'll be gone. Why is he saying it's going to affect our every relationship, our entire lives? Why is it, you know, this, the center play, uh, the, first, the first play was um, two people cruising and, mm -hmm. and, and one who had dedicated his entire life to sex saying, I will not bastardize sex. Yeah. I either have it or I don't. So I will yep. sit here and I will do nothing until the AIDS crisis is over. Right. And I think the last time the play was, and then I will kiss, I will kiss, I will kiss, having learned nothing. And, you know, that was the end of the first play. The second play was two lovers who had broken up for a bunch of years, got back together. But now that AIDS was around, they were scared to touch each other. Yeah. This was very real to me and my friends. The third play was the ex-wife of someone who died of AIDS and the ex-lover being the, of the same person right. fighting over, you know, having the anger of losing somebody. These were really real things. Critics came in and said, what is he talking about? He's a fool. This is not how it's You put your us. life, your experience up there, and someone dismisses it as not, as not as being honest. As a lie. As a lie. Yeah. And you sit there and you go, I can understand you saying I'm untalented. I can understand you saying I'm stupid or a bad actor or we did the sets badly or whatever, but I'm really not lying to you. This really is happening. And 20 years later, yeah, sad. those you were critics so right. went wrong. I was right. Yeah. The plays can still be done with great resonance. Right. So, so, but after you had felt, you know, you've been called for, for putting your your life, what you have observed, felt, seen on stage, been called a fraud. You leave the theater. What 
then brought you back? Was it hairspray? Was it this well, role? Well, no, no, no. I mean, I always wanted to do something, but you know, you wait for the right thing to do. You know, uh, um, I, it's not like I, I may have left the theater theater, but I mean, I was doing television and movies yeah, sure. and writing, and, yeah. and I've had four development deals with TV because I also believe that as entertainers, we need to reach the biggest audience yeah. we can. Mm -hmm. um, more people see the lowest rated television show yeah. that shows just one time, then we'll see the entire run of Hairspray sold out every night. Yeah. Um, communication's big with me, so I want to communicate. And so I, I've gone to other media, but, but I'm a theater creature. You know, the second I step on stage, I go, oh, that movie and TV stuff kind of. Well, you have a pilot, a TV development deal now, I read in Variety. Yeah, so we'll see, but that's my but you're But you're also willing to <laughs> I mean, I've, been, I've been down that road so many times. Do I hope this one will work out? Yeah, but you they know. just write your check and you turn the script, and if it goes somewhere, no. Well, yeah, but you hope. I mean, I did a I did a wonderful series. Well, not wonderful series, but it was we had a lot of fun with Dudley Moore, Dudley Moore and I, yeah, called yeah. Daddy's Girls, which they only we filmed thirteen. They only ever showed three. Oh, well. mm. Mm. But so. you know, that's that's TV. TV is really commerce. But. Theater. But but yeah. in the how much does you, you can't cut us off. You know, so I haven't we'll have to cut. Up all right, yet. All right, here we go. <laughs> no, we we were talking this morning, and well, I know this is going to show. This is going to show later later on down down the road. In May. Around the Tony Awards. Uh, yeah. Tony Awards. In May. But um, you, uh, I was told that you had a column this morning. We were talking about how the critics are going to go to Chicago and see Bounce, whether Sondheim wants it or not. And I was saying, when did theater become just? Um, a sports, sporting event instead of art. Where can an artist go to work out? I mean, we tried out Hairspray in Seattle. Right, right. We went to Seattle. And yet, though, still, though, you know, we read those reviews in Seattle, which were very good, and we all in New York wrote in columns, Hairspray's going to be the big hit. It's going to be... Nobody complained. Yes, we got but, no complaints wait, 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 about wait, wait, writing, wait, wait, writing wait, wait, a pop-up show on I ah. seem to remember, in, in my preparations for coming here, uh, people gave me different quotes um, that you'd written about me, and one of them said... <laughs> Every one of One of them said charming. something like, and here's a $10 million musical starring Harvey Firestein, who is, let's face it, no star. You, ah, that was a did, quote from you? Yes, it's a quote from you. That's because you were away for 15 ah. years. You were out there. <laughs> Doing bad TV shows. But Michael, Michael, <laughs> why? Michael, we don't take your clothes off and tell us who you really are. <laughs> why can't Sondheim have a safe haven in Chicago at the not-for-profit Goodman to do the show without the New York critics going and scrutinizing it? Why can't they have that safe space? Uh, because the general rule of thumb is that if a show like like a Hairspray has an announced Broadway opening, if it's an out-of-town tryout, the bounce? critics are not going to are not going to review it. Bounce is not. Bounce is having a world premiere. It's a world premiere of a St Stephen Sondheim musical directed by Hal Prince at the Goodman with no plans to come to New York. Now, Ben Brantley went out to see um, the revival of Death of a Salesman with Brian Dennehy at the Goodman Theater. No plans to okay. come to New York. He so raved about it, Hal, and they came to New York on the strength of his review. So if I call it's Hal, a newsworthy if I event. call Hal and I tell Hal, and if you announce that, you're, that your plan is to do it in Chicago and bring it to New York, that, that Michael Riedel and the rest will stay away. <laughs> will you, you do it? You He's going to have to book a theater <laughs> and reserve a date with the League of American. But on your <laughs> well, I'm going to be the, co I'm the cover boy of the, of the, uh, of the uh, theater. What is that thing, the, the theater listing? Um, Playbill. No, the theater listing, you know, the, the um, theatrical index. Oh, so really, <laughs> you are. Well, I actually cover girl. Yes, yeah, it. Edna. I want to make this point. I want to see what your reaction is, because you are going right into this Tony Award race now. I think that when the industry began putting so much emphasis on the Tony and what the Tony meant for careers and for the box office, I think then the press began to see it as the horse race and cover it as uh, well, more of think, a sporting event. So you don't, you don't think that, 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 that the, the Internet has really had those chat rooms, I think, have, have turned. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Have turned theater goers, or at least that small community, into the guys that go, uh, they're not managing the Mets right. This is what yeah, the yeah. lineup should look if like. If I were directing this show, yeah, I would. I think, no, I that, think it has that's done. happened, yeah. Yeah. which is also exciting. It is exciting as a theater person to want the audience that involved. Yeah. But it's also a little bizarre, like, you know, when something like when I played an April Fool's trick, and then all of a sudden they're going, oh my God, what did he do? You know, it was so mean when they totally misunderstand what I did. It didn't even happen, right? It right. never even yeah. happened. Right. But, also, there are a hundred spies out there now with people on the internet. You know, everything that happens backstage suddenly gets reported on oh, yeah. these. Now they're screaming so. at me, screaming, screaming. <laughs> well, we're just talking. Yes. No way. Yes. Yes. Turn so, up the so we have to say the, talking. Which, which camera? Camera on me, please. Turn, we're going to say so we're going to we're going to keep talking. we're going to keep talking and say good night, everybody. <laughs> and right, no, we want to say Harvey Firestein. It's a wonderful, wonderful performance as Edna Turnblad in uh, yes. Hairspray. 
and we wish you all what the luck. What ethnicity is turned black? I, what that's is, what that's I a very good know. question. Turned what is black, as you can black. understand, but black. <laughs> Go on, Harvey. She's <laughs> saying good night. We're talking. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. Pass well, the marmalade. Lovely to have you. Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, and public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theater lovers. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.